Good morning. We're in Matthew chapter 9. We're in striking distance of finishing the chapter. We shall see. So, how are you doing this morning? Good to see you guys. Verse 27 of Matthew 9 says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. He touched their eyes. We mentioned yesterday that how Jesus... He heals people in different ways all the time. Here he touches, sometimes he makes mud, sometimes he speaks, sometimes, you know, he, he keeps it different. He mixes it up a little bit. Now, I think I'm going to see if I can make it to the end of this chapter. So we'll kind of move through it. I won't dive too deep on all these things. But notice he says, according to your faith, let it be to you. You know, one time, this is the thing about... Um, studying the Bible as we get one verse and we can be pulled in a certain direction and you know and then but then we find out well no there's other verses that keep us in balance and I remember at one point I was thinking you know you do see this often in the scriptures uh, seeing that he had the faith to be healed Paul or Peter goes and talks Jesus according to your faith and so quite often we actually find that the healing element is the person being healed. Now, that's not always the case. I'm going to make the assumption that when Jesus healed the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, uh, whom Peter had just cut off his ear, wasn't Malchus's faith that saved him or that at least saved his ear, right? It was Jesus. Lazarus didn't have enough faith to come out of the grave. Jesus just called him. I'm sure there's probably other examples too where it's not necessarily the healee, the person being healed, whose faith um, the healing is dependent on. But I will say this, is that what you see more often than not, more often the case, it seems, in the Bible, as you move through and look at miraculous healing efforts, we don't see really miracle healers, people who have a unique and special gift to heal people. What you typically find are people with the faith to be healed and some believer prays for them, and they receive that healing. And so that's kind of the case here. Jesus says, according to your faith, let it be to you. And so we can't put God in a box saying all healing always depends on the faith of the person receiving the healing. But that's quite often the case. So at one point, I again, I, I was thinking, you know what? It seems like it's always the recipient, but it's like, no, there's examples where it's not. And so it helps keep us on our toes that we can again. I think it's too easy to put God in a box when we have all of our examples being one way and we start thinking we've got a routine for something. And But quite often, it is the heel E, not the heel er, who has the faith. Food for thought. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man. Mute and demon-possessed, both. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitude marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. So, haters gonna hate, huh? <laughs> I mean, 
it's fascinating because I'm not saying right or wrong, but what I'm going to say is that I've watched videos of even local to my region churches casting out demons. And sometimes it kind of looks like they're casting out the demon by the powers of the demons. I don't know. Am I a Pharisee? Or am I watching some whacked out stuff? I think, again, no one answer, right? It's not like we can put it all into one box. See, man, life would be so much easier, right? If everything was just black or white, right? Just easy, right? False, true. Okay, not okay. That would make being a Christian just like, so much easier. In fact, you know what? If, if they could just give me a list of rules to follow, and then I could say, I'm good or I'm bad. Give me 613 Levitical laws, and life would be so much easier. We like cut and dry. In fact, the only time we don't like cut and dry is when we're on the cut side or not the dry, you know, when we know that we're on the bad side. Then a little gray, fuzzy area might be okay. But at the end of the day, here we have the demons. They're accusing Jesus. Now, we know what Jesus is. We know that they're wrong. But the question is, is, man, some of the stuff I've seen, I would almost say the same thing as the Pharisees. Yet, I don't think I'm a Pharisee for thinking it. I'm just trying to take things in light of God's word and watch and observe. Last section here. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Do let me say this. The Bible doesn't have a whole lot of healing ministries where people go out, you know, and, and have a healing revival or whatnot. But when they do, everyone comes and everyone gets healed. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There is a good and meaty thing to end on. I think the first points we were making is how, you know, things can be this way or that way. Uh, God keeps us on our toes. And the only way to keep our balance is by learning how to rightly divide the word of truth. That we study the word diligently. All of us, all Christians, every believer, we study the word diligently so that we can be an approved worker of God, right? Not unapproved, not disavowed, but an approved worker of God, knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. That's our job. All of us. Not just me. Not just the smart Christians. Not just the, well, well he's into that kind of, no, we're all called to to learn the Bible, God's revealed will, his revealed plans, everything God has revealed, worth revealing, we find in the scriptures. And we have to understand that we need that balance so that we don't get fat and happy in our camps because people like camps. Sometimes I feel like I bug the people in my own camp because I'm willing to question the things that we believe. I'm okay with questioning things. Like, I don't mind questioning sacred cows <laughs> because it's just like, hey, why do we do things? Are we really sure? Could they be on to something? But at the end of the day, this last thing is that because the word of God is not studied, because the word of God is 
not taught. Notice it said in verse 35, he's teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, right? And we, we see these two things. In the synagogues, this is worth, I got a thousand rabbit trails for you today, but you can do a word study, okay, on Caruso, to herald, proclaim, often translated to preach, and uh, didascalo, uh, didascalos, right, didascalos, a lot of didask words. All the dada words, all those are based off of teaching. There's all these different words like variations of, you know, teaching, instructing, and thising and thatting, the verb, the noun, the this. But um, teaching, preaching. And the way we use these today is a little different than the way they do it back then and in the Bible. So I'm not trying to like talk about preachers and teachers today. But the general concept, though, still applies today is that in the New Testament, you almost never, I think only on two occasions, and actually we might have just seen it just recently, um, see preaching and teaching. The word preaching ever take place in a synagogue. In fact, I think it's in Mark where it talks about preaching in a synagogue and he was also casting out demons in the synagogue. So it sounds like there were just some issues in that synagogue. But otherwise, whenever he is with disciples, it says he's with disciples, Whenever he is at the synagogue, whenever he is at the temple, it always uses the word teach. And when he's in the towns, amongst the peoples, it always uses the word preach. This is consistent throughout the New Testament. And so what is that teaching us? Well, as believers, we are called to learn. And those who are above us are there to help teach us. I don't need someone to preach at me every day. Because you can use the word preaching um, in, in a great way. I mean, like Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, Preachers and Preaching. I love that book, right? It was great. But it, it's about preaching the word, right? We see that actually in 2 Timothy chapter 4, right? Verse 2, to preach the word in season, out of season, right? And the idea there is taking the word, the teaching of it, and really driving it home. But at the end of the day, typically preaching, this word caruso, it means to herald God's truth, to let the world know about Jesus and to proclaim Jesus amongst the nations. So inside the church, we need to be instructing believers really the best model. The best model, although it's not always perfect, it's not that you bring your unsaved friends to church and then they hear the gospel and they get saved. Although we try to share the gospel because we know unbelievers are coming. But the best model is that you instruct the Christians at the church to make them stronger and more equipped so that they on their own are going out and getting their friends saved and then bringing those saved friends to the church to be instructed, discipled, and brought up. The church gathering is really supposed to be for the edifying of the believer. And so what would happen if we started following this model? Well, we would have more laborers to send out. I like to teach or to preach or to at least share words of comfort and offerings of deliverance. But it's a good reminder that that's the message that the church members should be taking out to the community, to their families, to their friends, and to their co-workers. And they come to church with the expectation that they're going to be grown up, that they're going to be strengthened to defend themselves from false teachings, and which are just, they're just crazy these days, guys. The false teachings are abounding because people without a strong foundation are being sucked into these YouTube teachers who have very convincing arguments if you don't know all the things they're not saying. Tough, right? Well, how am I supposed to know all that? You just have to commit to being a student, a disciple. You've got to commit to learning and growing. Some of you guys, I, most of you guys, many of you guys, I see you guys every day. You've at least made a commitment to, to learning the word here at this time. But the catch is, is that Jesus tells them, guys, man, there's a really plentiful harvest out there. And I think many people 
are sadly uh, misguided, mistaken, discouraged, and just, what's the word I'm looking for? Despised, discouraged, it's another D word, obviously. I gotta alliterate because I'm a pastor, but, but I mean, they basically are just defeated thinking, what can I do if I go out and share the gospel? It's not gonna work. Everyone's just gonna reject it. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. He sees out there in your community, sheep without a shepherd, people who have a longing to know God and to be shepherded by him, but they don't know where to find him. And there's this harvest that's just waiting for someone, someone's to be obedient and to go out and share. Will you retire working part-time? What else could you be doing with your time? You know, Joshua was arguably 70s, in his 70s, when the walls of Jericho came a-tumbling down. Caleb, in his 80s, deciding he wants to go fight giants in, uh, in uh, Horeb. What's up with that? Well, it's because God's not finished with people who aren't finished. And Joshua might have thought that his battle against the Amalekites or his faithfulness as one of the two faithful spies would be his greatest moment. But it turns out 40 years later, in his 70s, he's going to be doing really what he's remembered by. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> God wants to use people who are willing to be used. And if you're in a season in your life right now where you have some free time, man, think what you could do for the kingdom of God if you just step out in faith. We should be praying to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers because there's a need for laborers. If you're in the Grandview area and the my my peeps, my young people who've done this before, they've gone up to Toppenish and down to Tri Cities. So they they cover ground. They go out and share the gospel sometimes. You should just volunteer to go along with them. Be a wingman. That's a great first step. Just come and join and see what it's like. Just hang on, hang around. And who knows? Maybe someday you'll go out. And you'll take someone on with you. Imagine, right? Disciples making disciples. I should write that down somewhere. It sounds like a really cool and novel idea. Came up with that one myself. All right, church. I have debated not doing the daily bread the next two days. We'll see. I'm at a conference in Tri-Cities trying to get some away time with my wife. So I'll post it if I don't. I'll post it on, on my Facebook page. But uh, otherwise, we finished chapter 9. 12 apostles are coming up next. Your job is to memorize the names of all 12 apostles before tomorrow. God bless you guys. Take care. I'll see you guys around.